Well, if that don't get you ready, then I don't know what will. Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you for the special singing this morning and all that's gone on. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter 10, and we're going to look there at verses 37 through 39. And we are going to preach on free, but not cheap. Free, but not cheap. Let's all stand this morning in honor of God's word, and we'll read out of his word these verses. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you this morning and we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for what has gone on in this church and Lord, the praise and the worship. And Lord, it's all about you. And we thank you this morning for what you do for us. Holy Spirit, we give you the right to do whatever you want to in this service today. And you, we ask that you lead us and guide us. I pray that you'll help me to preach and to teach your word. And Father, when we leave this place today, help us to say within our heart, surely it's been good to be in the house of God. Thank you for what you're going to do this morning. Thank you for all the love that you show us every day. In your precious sweet name we pray these things. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Tell somebody you love them before you sit down there. I want you to think on these words this morning as we are studying on this subject of free but not cheap. Words like dedication, devotion, discipleship, commitment, consecration, surrender, and sacrifice. You know, used to those words would really mean something. Words that were taught us as children about being servants and being dedicated, being devoted. But anymore in the day and time we li live in, those words seem not to be quite as, you know, interesting to us or quite as, um, you know, we just seem to kind of let them go by without even thinking about them. For instance, you take that word commitment. We live in a generation today that thinks nothing of commitment, especially in our marriages. Commitment years ago used to mean something. When people got married, they stayed married. But anymore, it's not like that. So when I say salvation is free, but discipleship is not cheap, I want to talk this morning just a moment to get us where we need to be. I want to talk on, the, on some terms that I've been studying for the last little while. One of the terms is day trader. Now, a day trader is someone that is a high-risk investor. They jump out and in stocks, you know, often many times a day. And the reason they do this is to capitalize on just the small change, you know, in prices of that stock. These people have virtually no interest in the stock they're looking at or the companies they look at. But what they are doing, they, they are purchasing those stocks to make a profit out of them. So they catch these stocks and they see the value go up and they sell these stocks and they get out. It's a, a quick opportunity to make some money. And then also there's another group of investors who have become known as dot-com investors. They look for internet companies that spend, and they spend little time researching these firms or these companies, but what they do is they buy into them on a marginal basis and 
as soon as the price increases, they sell them. I think the same things is happening to our church, churches all around. I think there's a lot of what we sh probably should call day traders and dot-com investors in the church. Uh, they want to know little about, about, about God in reality, and many think they can buy a small share of Christianity, you know, and uh, just investigate Jesus a little bit, and that they're part of of this family of God. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that's not the way it works. In the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 25, it tells us there, if you look back there, uh, in Luke chapter 14 is where we're going to be the rest of the sermon. In Luke 14, 33, it says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciples. And then uh, Luke 14, 25, when you go down there, it's talking about this core of followers, that, this multitude of followers that are around Jesus. When he was preaching, there was all kinds of people there. There was a huge crowd. But I want you to know, not all that were in this crowd were believers. Most of them were there to try to see, you know, who this Jesus was. They wanted to see a miracle. They wanted to see this. They wanted to see that. And, and a lot of them was there just to mock Jesus. There's a phrase that rings through these passages in Luke 14 three times and gives the message that I want to share with you today. Three times Jesus said, he cannot be my disciple. He said that in verse 26, verse 27, and verse 33. And unlike a lot of churches I know, Jesus was not looking for a crowd here. He was not really looking for the commitment. He was not looking for a decision. He was looking for disciples. He was looking for people that would truly follow him. And I think in our day and time, he's looking for people that will truly follow him. We have a lot of people that come to church just like a day trader or a dot-com investor. They come to church, and they want to know a little bit about what's going on, but the only reason they want to know a little bit is for what they could get out of it. And our church houses are full of them. Because we live in a generation today that that's the way we think. We think, what's in it for me? People come to church, and they'll, they'll check out churches. You know, they'll call all kinds of churches, and they'll say, well, what's in it for me? What do you have for my kids? What do you have for this? What do you have for uh, my fellowship? Do you have any uh, women's uh, ministry? Do you have a um, men's ministry? And that's a fair question. It's a fair question. But listen, folks, it's not all about you. It's about your relationship with Christ. So when God is speaking to us here in this, in this scripture, he's looking for commitment. He's looking for us to make decisions and right decisions. He's looking for us to be his disciples. Now, we rarely refer to Christians today as disciples... It was the most common name in the Bible for those who followed Jesus. But, in fact, in the Gospels and the book of Acts, Christians are called disciples 264 times there. One thing you have to say about Jesus, when he is talking to us about this, and you'll see that in just a moment, when he's talking to us about this subject of being disciples and Christians and all that that is meant to be, I want to tell you something. He, he does not have any fine print in the contract. Everything he tells us is right out there for us to see. He never puts, you know, he never uh, put, pulls any punches with us when it comes to the gospel of Christ and what we're supposed to be. In fact, as we get into this message today, it almost seems as if the Lord, instead of trying to build a crowd, He's trying to thin one out. 
And if you intend to be a true follower of Jesus Christ this morning, I think there's three questions that God asked us. And the first question is this. What is the position of Christ in my life? The Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 14 verse 26, now listen real good. If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now sometimes this verse, this verse here causes a lot of problems. It causes a lot of unnecessary problems because it appears as if Jesus is telling us to hate the ones that we should love the most. But I'm here to tell you this morning, that's not what Jesus meant here. And I want you to listen really good. Because the word hate here, it really has the meaning to love less. In other words, what Jesus is saying here, you ought to love your family a lot less than you love him. Your love for Him should be supreme. If you're a Christian, if you're going to be His disciple, if you're going to be what He wants you to be, then your love for Him needs to be supreme. But folks, I'm telling you, in the day and time we live in, He comes second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth in most people's lives. He's just something that we need when we need Him. We pull Him off the shelf. And we say, oh, Jesus, I need you now. And then when that problem's fixed, we put Him right back up on the shelf. But God says, if you want to be a follower of Him, if you want to be a disciple of Him, He has to be first. Now, when we look at these verses, we have to think about the times that he's speaking of here. Because one of the reasons Jesus said this 2,000 years ago, if you gave your life to him, you really had to give your whole life to him. Because I'm here to tell you, if you were a follower of Jesus, people hated Jesus, and they hated those people that followed him. So what happened was, if you were a follower of Jesus, and if you were Jewish especially, then you most likely had to give up everything. You most likely had to give up family, you most likely had to give up friends, because it was such a hard time to follow Jesus. And by the way, this story, the same story can be true in our day and time, especially in these uh, Muslim countries that, that they, they will kill Christians. A lot of times Christians in these countries have to go underground. A lot of times they have to leave family. They have to leave each other because of the danger that that poses to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus was speaking of here, he was speaking that sometimes to follow him will even cost our lives. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, he must be your first love. He will never take second place to anyone or to anything. And you know what the sad thing this morning is? A lot of people has put him second place to things. Money, houses, prestige, whatever it may be, we have put him second place. He will take none of it. I asked the crowd this morning, I asked the first uh, church service, I asked them, I said, can you imagine, and I'm speaking to you ladies right now, can you ladies imagine a man proposing to you and saying, I want to marry you, I want you to marry me under this one condition. If down the road another woman comes into my life that I love more than you, you will have to leave. I know that sounds funny. But you know what? If you don't love Jesus more than you love your family, then you don't love your family as much as you should. The person who loves others most is the person who loves Jesus best. 
Let me tell you something this morning, folks. As being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when you put Him first, every love that you have will be what it's supposed to be if Jesus is first in your life. You'll love your wife right. You'll love your children right. You'll love your friends right if Jesus is first. And that's exactly what He's telling us here. Him first. He can't take second place, and he won't take second place. When I thought of this this service this morning, I thought about how there is a sacrifice to serve God. There's a sacrifice that needs to come in our life if we're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ the way we're supposed to. But folks, we do not sacrifice anymore. There's no sacrifice in our lives. If it doesn't come easy, we don't do it. And can I say this morning, nothing about being a Christian is easy. It's always a fight. It's always a war. We're we're supposed to be soldiers, not diplomats. We are soldiers in the army of God. And we're supposed to move forward. There's a sacrifice all of us need to make. He needs to come first. He must come ahead and go ahead of our families and our friends and and everything in our lives. He has to go ahead of everything, even our finances. Someone has said, well, there's three classes of Christians on this train uh, that is going to heaven. There's third class Christians. What's that? That's the ones that's put Jesus present in their lives. And then there are second-class Christians. Those are the ones that have put Jesus prominent in their lives. And then there are those first-class Christians. Those are the ones who have put Jesus preeminent in their lives. And I asked you this morning, which class are you? Because, folks, you cannot be His disciple without putting Him preeminent in your life. Every decision you make is because He allows you to make it. Everything in your life is because He's allowed it to be there. His will needs to be your will. That's what Jesus says. You said, well, I I, I don't know if I can do that. Then you, as He said three times in these verses of Scripture, you cannot be His disciple if you're not willing to. That's what He says. There's a second thing, the value of Christ in my life. How do you value Him? The Bible says in Luke 14, 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And some of you are here this morning, you're saying, Well, I've read those scriptures before, but I just thought they were there. Folks, when God says something in His Word, He means it. And we don't preach on it anymore. There's a lot of churches that are just so seeker-friendly that they would never preach a message like this because they, wouldn't, uh, they know that people wouldn't come back after a message like this was preached. But folks, we have to preach the Word of God and what God says about us living for Him. And the Bible says this morning that whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He's very plain there. If you want to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to live for Him, salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It's going to cost you something. And I think a lot of times in church houses, we do not tell people what it costs to follow Christ. It costs us something to follow Him. Jesus said there's a price. Uh, There's a price that was paid in order to save you. It cost Him something. For our salvation. And we have to pay the price in order to serve Him. Oh, preacher, I've never heard that before. I mean, serving's bad enough, but now we have to pay a price to serve Him? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We do. There's a price to be paid. We live in a world today that we don't want to pay no price. Oh, we want the the best jobs, and we want the highest position, but we don't want to pay the price to get there. We want it given to us. 
But God said in his service that there's a price to be paid for being servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think the reason that many people do not uh, come to Christ is because they do not want to pay the price. But Christ will not compromise on this. You see, there's no changing Him on this. This is the way He wants it to be. There is no other way to follow Christ but the way Christ wants us to follow Him. We don't make bargains with Him. It's the way it is. And God says, I will not compromise. He will not negotiate on this. When we look at this verse, the cross was a symbol of one thing in that day. What was it? It was a symbol of death. And that's what God is speaking about here. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, death. We don't like to talk about death. But folks, I'm here to tell you the only reason a man would take up a cross was because he was going to die. And Jesus is, makes it very plain here that he, will not only, he not only expects us to live for him, but he expects us to die with him. That means get rid of all this old stuff. The world is so confused with the way we live because they see us one way on Sunday and see us another way on Monday. And God says if we're going to be his disciple, that we have to die to self. And if we die to self, that means that we have life in him. I think a lot of people are just play, playing Christian. It makes them feel better to go to church on Sunday morning. It makes them feel better to go to Sunday school and take their kids to church. But really on the inside, there's no change. We haven't changed. We're the same. And God says, if we are saved, if we are to be his disciple, that we die to self. What does that mean if we die to self? That means he moves in and lives there. And that means that he leads us and he guides us and he directs us. Jesus makes it very plain that he expects us to die with him. You say, what kind of death does it take? You have to die to self. Have you ever seen a generation that's so selfish? No, not too many amens right there. I'll just go ahead and amen myself. Amen. We're the most selfish generation ever. And we're not willing to die to self. Die to ambition. You say, now preacher, that's where I draw the line. I've got ambition. I want to do this. I'm going here. I'm going there. I've got a ladder I'm climbing. I hope Jesus has put that ladder in place for you because if Jesus hadn't put that ladder in place for you, you're climbing the wrong ladder. We have to die to our own ambition. We have to die to our own desires. I told him this morning, when I was a young man playing football, I wanted to play quarterback for Miami Dolphins. But I told him yesterday over there, but that didn't happen. Ambition. A lot of times our ambition takes over our spirituality, and we don't live for Christ because our ambition gets in the way. A lot of people come to church, and they're so ambitious, ambitious that they've forgotten how to follow Christ. He said, you cannot be my disciple unless you die to self. If you're not willing to die to self this morning, then you cannot be a Christian. Amen. Now, I know that's not popular preaching, but it's the truth. We've got to surrender our life. We sing that song, I surrender all, I surrender all. We sing it, but we don't mean it. It makes us feel good. Oh, I went to church Sunday morning. He talked on uh, being a disciple. I sang that song. I surrender all. And when we leave, we don't mean a word we've said. And folks, the truth of the matter is, God says, you cannot be my disciple. We're play acting. We're going through the motions without really being surrendered to the Lord. You cannot be my disciple, he said. 
You know, a lot of people uh, want to win a popularity contest in this world. You know, they, they, they want to be popular. They, uh, they want to have prestige. They don't want to put themselves first and in the limelight. And there are Christian people that can do that and let God lead them. And then there are people that say they are Christian and don't know Him at all. This Christian life is not a popularity contest. Some of these preachers, you know, that all they care about is being on 198 channels and, and selling 5 million books and all this stuff. I'm telling you, they better watch that. Because it's not, listen, it's not about them. This ministry, listen to me this morning, is not about me. And it's not about you. And when we get God out of the place He needs to be in, and the place He needs to be in not only in our heart, but the place He needs to be in in our church, folks, if we get Him out of place, we'll be in trouble. And there's so many churches that are in trouble this morning, and they don't understand why. They're doing all the right things. They have all the right programs. Uh, they're doing all the right ministries. They have uh, a women's ministry and men's ministry and, and children's ministry and, and choir ministry and, and all these ministries. They're doing the right thing. But the problem is they're doing the right things, but they've forgotten to put Christ in the center of it. And that's what happens to a lot of churches, but that's what's happened this morning to a lot of lives. It's been about a popularity contest in your, in your world. And you've not bothered to follow Jesus the way He demands for us to follow Him. By the way, He does, a, he does demand an answer to this question. He wants to know who's going to rule and reign over your life this morning. Is it Jesus or is it you? And the sad thing about it this morning is people will leave this church after hearing the gospel, after hearing the music, after hearing about Jesus all morning long. They will leave this church and still not be disciples of Christ. People that have been in church a long time. People that have been in church only a few weeks. People will leave. If you're going to put Jesus on the throne, you're going to have to put yourself on the cross. And that's the way it is. When Christ is on the cross, self is on the throne. When self is on the cross, Christ is on the throne. That is the kind of surrender that he wants this morning. He wants surrender. He wants sacrifice. That's what he's asking for. I know that's not popular, but that's what he wants. Are you willing to do that? Because if you're not willing to give sacrifice and surrender this morning, then God can't use you. There's one thing I can say about all these terrorists. They, they're willing to die for what they believe in. But the tragedy is that these terrorists are more willing to pay the price and more willing to die for, for a lie then Christians are to live for the truth. We have the truth this morning, folks. We know the truth. We hear the truth every week. Preach to us, talk to us. We know what the truth is, but still, we don't follow the truth. If we follow the truth this morning, there is. Listen to me, look at me. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. If we follow the truth this morning, there's a price you'll have to pay for that. There's a cost that will be counted. How often today do we worry about the price of something when we ought to consider the cost of something? For example, let's just say that, that uh, the price of $100,000 for a Mercedes... Well, there's the price, $100,000. That's the same price for both me and Donald Trump. But I can assure you the cost is for far more for me than it would be him. Amen? I'm going to give you one more thing that we're going to dismiss. 
The point Jesus makes in the first of many parables, he says in Luke 14, 28, For which of you, listen now, For which of you intending to build a tower setteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? The Christian life is like a strong tower. It's to be a tower of work, a tower of worship, a tower of witnessing, a tower of warfare. But there's a tremendous cost in building this tower. Everybody listen? It's going to cost you something to build this tower. Do you know how many so-called Christians drop out of church? A lot of them. You, you could just look around our crowd and you could say, man, they used to come to church all the time and this one used to come to church. And you know, that used to bother me so much and I would try to get them back in church and try to talk to them. And they'd say, oh, well, so-and-so hurt me. And I, I always thought uh, of this verse. Listen, folks, are we following so-and-so or are we following Christ? Because you see, what Christ is trying to do in your life this morning is build a strong tower. I remember when I was a kid, and, and, and you know some of those men down there at the first church, and, and I would think to myself, that man's a Christian. I know he, I could count on them. I could count on those ladies that taught Sunday school. They were there all the time. Didn't have to worry about them missing church because they, came, because they had decided they were going to run the race, that they were going to be a strong tower in that church so that people could see them and know that they were going to be there. It's hard to find that anymore. It's hard to find people that will, will be a strong tower in the middle of the desert. In the middle of, of, of hurt and pain and, and, and wanting sometimes. and it, It's a hard life. It's costing us something to be this strong tower. And the reason I believe that so many so-called Christians fall by the wayside and disappear is because they're not willing to pay the price that it costs to follow Christ. And folks, we've got to change that. We've got to change it not because I'm saying it this morning, not because I'm preaching it this morning, but because the Bible tells us that it's going to cost us something. The number one problem we have with a lot of church members who are on the rolls but never show up is this. They have half-finished towers. Oh, they made one lap around. You know, you know them. You've seen them. They get all excited and they make one, one lap around, you know, and, and they're real excited. They may stay for two years, three years. They, they get involved in all the programs and singing and, and teaching Sunday school and, and all this stuff, the youth and all this. They get real excited and all of a sudden they're gone. You wonder why. And you go see them. Oh, so-and-so said something about me. You're supposed to be this strong tower. You're supposed to be this, this tower that stands in the middle of the wilderness and the desert. And you're supposed to be that, that one that people look at and say, that's a real Christian. He's light. He's salt. She's light. She's salt. She loves the Lord. That's who you're supposed to be. Where are they at? And God one day will ask and will stand before him. They ran a lap of Christian life and they quit. They fought one round in the Christian life and they quit. Folks, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that the devil doesn't come to me sometimes and say, why don't you just quit? Does he not do that to you? Why don't you just quit? I'll tell you why I don't quit. I don't quit because he's all I got. I don't have anything else but him. He's my love. He's everything about me. I can't quit. What have I got to go back to? That old stuff. There's nothing back there. All I've got to him. But some of you are here this morning and you're trying to go back there. What do you got back there? You need to dedicate your life. 
You used to be that strong tower that stands up in the midst of the storms. And people would look at you and say, I know that's a Christian. And that's what a Christian's supposed to be like and act like. And today you need to come to this altar and say, God, I'm sorry for not being that tower that I need to be at my church. So that these young people can see what Jesus really is. What Jesus really can do in the life of someone that's sold out. That knows that he loves them and they, they love him. But Christianity this morning is not for the faint of heart. You've been called, as I said a minute ago, to be soldiers. You've been called this morning to know what's right and what's wrong. And repent of the things that are wrong in your life. And be that disciple that God wants you to be. Straighten up. Do things that are right. Get back in the fight. It's not too late. God loves you. And God wants to do a mighty work in you and through you. But there's so many out there that just want to be godly enough to be accepted by the Lord and worldly enough to be accepted by the world. And that's where we're at this morning. And I'm asking you, I'm begging you in, in this invitation today, I'm begging you to stand up and be that strong tower. You run that one lap, but you're not running anymore. You started that work, that good work God put in you, but you're not doing it anymore. Oh, I'm too old now, preacher. You never get too old. Never. God can use you, but God needs you. God needs you this morning to be that disciple and all that that implies. If you're going to be a disciple, you've got to take up your cross. You've got to. You've got to, take, you've got to forsake this world. You've got to leave it behind. You've got to let Him change you altogether. Remake you. Put you on the potter's wheel. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's not easy. And you've got to be that strong tower that people can see Jesus. That's who you've got to be. Would you bow your heads this morning? With nobody looking around. You know, this morning at our early morning service, God was so good. We had people come to the altar this morning and say, I, I want to I wanna be what God wants me to be. I know it's going to cost me something. But you're here this morning, and those that are watching by live stream this morning. I, I want to give you an opportunity also to accept Christ or to ask Christ to help you to be that strong tower. But you're here this morning and God is dealing with you on your life. What He wants you to be. From the oldest to the youngest, God uses us all. He'll use all of us if we'll allow Him. But I'm going to ask you right now, you're a Christian and you know you're a Christian, but God is dealing with you on being in that strong tower this morning, on being that one that He can use and let people look to to know what a Christian really is. I'm going to ask you to step out right now and come. Would you come right now? Amen. Come on. Step out right now and come and say, God, I want to be that strong tower. Would you come right now? We're not going to linger, I promise you. If you don't come, we're going to dismiss. People are coming, you're not by yourself. From the youngest to the oldest, God wants to use you. Would you come right now? You're here this morning and God...